The system is full. Can't take you anymore. Can't take you anymore, I'm sorry. Left now is a dirty word in his, in, in his way. Do I think art can save the planet? I do, actually. In former Vice President Joe Biden's first public appearance since seven women said he touched them inappropriately, he spoke to a mostly male audience of electrical workers. I just want you to know I had permission to hug Lonnie. I mean, he, he, he After hinting at an apology without actually apologizing, Biden hinted at 2020 without actually declaring. This whole episode of the past week, is this going to change how you campaign? Well, I think it's going to have to change somewhat how I campaign. Motel 6 will pay $12 million to settle a lawsuit filed by Washington State, which alleges the company shared information on 80,000 guests with Immigration and Customs Enforcement. The suit says ICE targeted customers with Latino-sounding names, leading to at least nine arrests. After Prime Minister Theresa May's Brexit plan was rejected three times by Britain's parliament, she decided to continue her winning strategy of asking for the same thing and hoping for a new result. Today, May asked the EU to extend the Brexit deadline for the second time to June 30th. She'll get her answer next Wednesday. Defamation lawsuits filed by seven women against Bill Cosby have been settled in federal court, but apparently not by Cosby. His attorney says his insurer settled without his client's consent, and that Cosby's still pursuing his counterclaims of defamation against the women. Gaza Street. Gaza. Gaza Street, here you see. But with a lot of terrorists. People who don't want to live. Because to defeat the state of Israel, they will not defeat them. Israel is in the home stretch of a critical general election set for this coming Tuesday. But like a lot of Israelis, Eyal Hashbi has already made up his mind. He's voting for the party of four-term Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. אני הולך להצביע על הליכוד. ליכוד. Why? יש לי דעה אחת של מדינה אחת, ארץ השלמה, ושלא לא צריך לוותר על שום חלק ממנה. It isn't just Israelis within range of Gaza who overwhelmingly support Netanyahu. Polls show Netanyahu as the favorite to be prime minister once more, which might be surprising considering that he's facing indictments on three corruption charges. Some voters here just don't seem to care. Who are you voting for in the elections? Bibi. Bibi Shelanu. Bibi Aluf. What do you care about? Do you care about security? Do you care about the economy? What are the biggest issues? Shmira ala aretz ala gvulot. Lo limkor otanu la aravim. So that's your father with Netanyahu. Yes. He was a friend of him. And you? Do you support Netanyahu? Yes. What is it that you like about him? What I like him? He's really a tough man. He's tough man. Tough man. Likud's only real challenge is from a newly formed centrist alliance, calling itself Blue and White, which is trying to position itself as a unifier. Netanyahu without the baggage. I was raised in a village where religious and secular people live side by side, never had problem with that issue. We knew how to live one aside the other, and I'm telling you, I will do it on the national level as well. Blue and White is led by three former chiefs of Israeli Defense Forces, and it's leaning heavily on those military credentials to chip away at Likud's control. In this campaign ad, party leader Benny Gantz counts the number of Palestinians he's killed. At a party event, Gantz suggested that Blue and White would try to copy Netanyahu's strategy and partner with hardline right-wing religious parties to form a governing majority. 
We have left aspects in our party, we have right aspects in our party. So if we will be the biggest uh, party, we will have the sufficient base to start the dialogue from there and I think we can do it. Uh, Ultra-Orthodox parties, possibly? All of them are possible. Arab parties? I basically exclude no one, but they have to support the Zionist idea and they have to be democratic and unfortunately, and they cannot be racist. Eitan, over to you there. Yes, please. Do you not think by saying that you are happy to work with right-wing parties, but hinting that you most likely wouldn't work with left-wing politicians or Arab politicians, that in the long term you could potentially feed into hatred, divide, and then instability? Definitely not. Uh, look, I've been meeting with all of them. So I think we will be able to unify the country by far more than Netanyahu is doing right now. One reason bigger parties aren't catering to the left is because it's shrunk so drastically. Today, only 12% of Israelis identify as left-wing. A development watched with frustration by former Prime Minister Ehud Barak, who ousted Netanyahu in 1999, and who, as leader of the Liberal Labour Party, pushed for making peace with the Palestinians. These days, Labour and the political will for a negotiated peace have all but vanished. Yeah, Bill Clinton, I worked with him a long time. That's that from before I was elected, 94. Everybody will remember 2000 and Camp David and your inability to give the Palestinians the state that they wanted. Do you bear some of the responsibility for the fact that people in Israel perhaps no longer believe in a peace process? No, I don't think that's about uh, responsibility. I was responsible for everything that happened under my uh, command when I was uh, prime minister. I did what I thought is important for the uh, country. Do you think that Benjamin Netanyahu should lead the government into another term? No, I think not. It's, he dived in the recent year into an unholy alliance between himself and a group of others who are both corrupt and corrupting. Those zealots, messianic racist zealots, they are dictating to him how to operate and they have common interest to block the normal uh, democratic life of Israel. And that should be rejected by the people. Why is it then? People in Israel, at the moment, according to Paul, still think that he is the best man to lead the country into the next government. First of all, probably the people are wrong. They have to, someone had to help them to open their eyes. That's usually the political opponent. But right now, even the center left it ha is nowhere to be seen. It's not being able to mount a campaign against him. Why? They can, even now, five days before uh, election, if they would just wake up and, and, and charge on him, on every arena. A successful charge from the left would require unity, and few Jewish parties are willing to throw their lot in with those who could tip the balance against Netanyahu, the Israeli Arabs. <laughs> Ofer Kasif from Khadash Ta'al, a coalition of communists and secular Arabs, is one of the only candidates openly canvassing the isolated community, which makes up 20% of the population. We are not an Arab party, we are a Jewish Arab party. Yeah, you're Jewish. But they call uh, us, everybody, uh, in purpose, Arab parties. And they say... Is that a dirty Gantz word here? Sorry? If it's, is that a dirt, considered a dirty word? Yeah, of course, like left. Left now is a dirty word in, in, in Israel. That's one of the things that we are trying very hard to challenge. In my view, the Labour Party is, is a, is a continuous, continuously sinking because it is afraid. It is afraid of being a, a, a leftist party. You should present an alternative. They don't present any alternative. Not a serious one, not a deep one, just a cosmetic one, if ever. Chickens. And those chickens are going to the slaughter named Likud. Today, President Trump pulled his own nominee for Director of Immigration and Customs Enforcement. Ron's a good man. 
but we're going in a tougher direction. We want to go in a tougher direction. A few hours later, at a meeting with Border Patrol in California, Trump repeated threats to shut down the border and imposed new tariffs on Mexico that would supersede a brand new trade deal. He seems to be testing out policies on the fly. So as I say, and this is our new statement, the system is full. Can't take you anymore. Can't take you anymore, I'm sorry. And look, I inherited this stuff and we're gonna get it fixed. We have to. If he inherited this stuff from anyone, it was Obama's last Homeland Security Secretary, Jay Johnson who faced a surge at the border in 2014 when more than 68,000 unaccompanied minors, mostly from Central America, crossed illegally. So tell me what you said that piqued the interest of the president actually tweeted about your yes, TV appearance. Well, I said that 4,000 arrests on our southern border, 100,000 in a month is truly a crisis. I then went on to in the same interview prescribe all the things that I think should be done to deal with the crisis and what we seem to be doing wrong. The one sentence, it is truly a crisis, quote unquote, basically went viral. And the reason for this, of course, is that people in the administration, the president himself and his allies, basically say, see, even the Obama guy says it's a crisis. You have to believe us now. Well, 4,000 in a day, 100,000 in a month, by any measure, by any definition, is a crisis. The fact that people at those levels are leaving those countries, it's a crisis in terms of our border personnel's ability to handle it and process all those people. And it's a crisis in terms of the communities along the border that have to somehow absorb those numbers. Let's take a look at the current administration. Are they doing a good job? As long as you fail to address the underlying conditions that lead people to flee the burning building in the first place, it's going to revert back to its longer term patterns. And that's exactly what's happening. That's happened all throughout 2018. But now in March, April 2019, we're seeing levels we haven't seen in 12 years. So plainly what the current administration is doing is not working. People in Washington want simple solutions. They want some legal lever to pull, like close the border or declare an emergency to solve illegal migration. We want quick fixes. Build a wall. We want quick fixes. Dealing with illegal migration from Central America requires a long-term investment and a sustained political commitment in addressing the poverty and violence in the Northern Triangle. We've done this before. It can work if done smartly. Suspending aid to Central America is the exact wrong thing to do. So when you were at DHS, you were running DHS, the Obama administration, as you well know, was heavily criticized for its immigration policy. What was it that you did that you think was, you know, successful over that period of time at minimizing the number of people coming over illegally? I would say three things contributed to the rather sharp downturn we saw in summer 2014. One, messaging about the dangers of the journey. Two, we expanded family detention, which was controversial. And three, we got the Mexican government to help us on their southern border. The Mexicans stepped up and put more border security resources on their southern border with Central America. And the combination of those three things, I think, contributed pretty quickly and pretty significantly to a downturn such that by 2015, we saw the second lowest number of apprehensions since 1972. When you look at the way Washington DC is talking about these governments and talking about what they will do to alleviate these problems, I mean, what's your reaction? When someone through their rhetoric continues to demean you and demean who you are as a Guatemalan, a Honduran, a Mexican, it becomes a matter of national honor. There is a way to achieve our own interest without insulting our neighbors. But you kind of have to admit, you know, it's not even that much of a heterodox opinion these days, but you kind of have to admit that it works. If Donald Trump says domestically works. People voted for him, people wanted that wall. Well, it worked in this country. chanting that wall, it worked in this country. But that except, is what except is- Except that illegal yeah. migration now on his watch is the highest it's been in 12 years. So plainly, what we are doing to enforce our border security now for the last two years is not working. Of 
course, the day you start something like this, you, the lights aren't going to come all the way on. Mood lighting. <laughs> Elliot Crump is the school superintendent in Shelby, Montana, one of the countless small rural towns that's run out of teachers. Yeah, you guys have 20 minutes. The kids that come out of Bozeman and Missoula and our education schools here in Montana, they tend to, to focus on those larger cities. It's going to be nice to get them out here, see what it's like, and hopefully get them to join the rural teaching community. 250 miles away in Bozeman, 13 aspiring teachers from Montana State University headed out for Shelby. What a, what a good morning, gosh. <laughs> Shelby, Montana. I actually, I don't know too much about it. I looked it up on Google Maps. That's the only, the only research I did. Zoomed in and it looked pretty brown, but it's okay. I'm excited anyway. It's I'm not there for the landscape, I'm there for the people. I love small towns. I came from a small town and I've always wanted to teach in a small school. So yeah, I'm super stoked. You are approaching your destination. Ooh, we are approaching. Good morning, good morning, good morning. So I'll go first. My name is Elliot Crump. I'm the superintendent here. I used to teach social studies. I'm originally from the Seattle area. I'm Jake Lyle. Um, I'm originally from Plains, Montana. Graduated there in 2016. Uh, I'm studying English teaching. I want to be an English teacher. Good morning. Uh, my name is Ned Bardsley. When I grow up, I want to be an art teacher. <laughs> I would love the, the practicum students to go through this program, enjoy being here in Shelby, and when I have an opening next year, the year after that, the year after that, they're thinking, gosh, it would be really nice to, to be able to go back to Shelby and be a part of that community and that school. I don't know if it's gonna work, but I hope it does. Shelby, Montana spans six square miles and is home to about 700 families, one K through 12 school, and one main street that runs only a few blocks. It's an hour and a half from the nearest Walmart, three hours from the nearest Costco, and four hours from the nearest major airport. There are some districts in Montana that don't get an applicant for a job. You know, even 10 years ago, they were still pulling in people, getting applications, being more selective about who we can hire. Now it's just find someone. Dr. Tina Versland researches rural education. For the last three years, she's helped run the program that sends future teachers on a week-long date with the towns that need them the most. If you're a school and you can't fill teacher positions, what ends up happening to like your <laughs> offerings? What ends up happening to your school, your students? If you can't find teachers, Young parents start to pull their kids out of school. They start sending them to neighboring schools. Maybe they leave that area. So schools can't find teachers. The, you know, schools die. Community dies. Shelby isn't dead, but in small towns throughout Montana, this is already an emergency. Nearly half of all schools in the state now employ teachers who aren't certified and almost all of those schools are in rural communities. What was your temperature? 400. I think it's cooked. That's good. So we met in New York, started dating in New York. I was a city girl. I never thought I would be like in Montana. When I told my parents I was moving to Montana, they're like, where is that? You moving to the mountains? Moving to the mountains? <laughs> It's a, it's a state. So you've been here for five years. You've, yep. you've seen people come and go. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, when we first got here, we hired 10 teachers, and I lost eight of them within a year or two. I haven't heard of things that I haven't tried. If I heard about it, I would have tried it. That's, uh, 36. Yeah, 36. One of the things Elliot has pioneered, oh, yeah, looking for teachers outside of the country in places where $35,000 a year is a small fortune. Four years ago, he hired his first teacher from the Philippines. He's since hired four more. Shelby is like, oh my God, this is really a small town. And I didn't even see people walking on the streets and said, oh my gosh, this is kind of, you know, it's like a ghost town or something. I imagine you weren't like, I'm gonna go teach in Shelby, Montana. No, no, it's the Shelby who chose me. 
even though we don't have that much of um, shopping malls and all the stuff. Um, but we like the simplicity of Shelby. I could send money to uh, my, my family back in the Philippines and I could also save money. So it's really, really helpful. So bringing the Filipino teachers here has worked, right? They've come, they've wanted to stay. How it works in the long run, I'm not sure. Their end of their visa is going to be after five, well, three years, then they can get a two-year extension. After that, they'll be heading back to the Philippines. It doesn't sound like a long-term solution to the problem. It, it doesn't sound like a long-term solution. Congratulations. That's why Elliot and the whole town rolled out the red carpet for the MSU students. Equal lap. There we go. X. Nice job. All right. Equal lateral triangle. Welcome to your favorite class. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. yeah. All right. First off, how y'all doing with it? Good. Good. Talk to you guys. Okay. So you're gonna try to capture that bravely as well. When they weren't in classrooms teaching, they were given the star treatment. They took Shelby's fire trucks out for a joy ride. Yes. They shot guns. And they went bowling. The 20 somethings are 20 somethings. They want to know what happens after 8 p.m. on a school night. Let's see what the first one we get. Oh, come on. KC, 22. How do you up your, your age? I think I'm going to need to do that. Oh, yeah, definitely do how that. Do you, how do you do that? I, I got two. I got two. You don't have a lot of options. I don't have many options here. This is 76 mile. I moved it up to 50 and then we're I mean, you could be like a really big fish in a small pond. True. Maybe. Hello. Hi. I'm Rochelle. Josh. Josh, nice to meet you. So for someone in their 20s, like, what are the sort of things that you end up doing? Well, other than going out on a county road and just shooting gophers or shooting <laughs> basically anything, I mean, as far as the community goes, we have pool league, dart league, bowling league. That's where you're, you're bored. You're bored. Oh, bro. <laughs> <laughs> Who here would move to this area if they were offered a job today? <laughs> I said, I'd have to, I'd have to talk to my fiance. <laughs> I'm like, I can't like totally put up my hands. Jake, you're very, you're super down to move here. Like, you would move here now, but your immediate response was, if I can convince my fiance. Uh, it'd be a hard sell probably for my fiance. She's an interior designer and there's probably not many interior design jobs around Shelby. I think the issue is a social life. <laughs> so like, the school's great, but what are you gonna do outside of school? Bowling league! <laughs> <laughs> Small towns are probably not for everybody, but you owe it to yourself to give it a chance to do more than drive through it and, and experience it for yourself. I don't know how long I can stay. And that's, I think that's the problem we're facing. I don't know how I could help that. What do you think about LED lights? Very yeah. futuristic. Do you, do you guys know what it's about? No, no. no so it's just, just for weeks, I thought. Where that light is, it's supposed to show how much sea levels will rise according to what scientists are predicting right now. That's very, very high. <laughs> the work, called Lines, was installed by Finnish artists Timo Aho and Pekka Nitaverta a year ago on the Scottish island of North Uist, population 1200. They wrap around an art center and a disused dairy and slice across the field that separates the village from the open ocean. How do the lights work? What turns them on? The lights are turned on when the tide comes in. We have float switches in the bay, which when the tide comes in, the, the floats pop up. 
How do people understand climate change around here? I think people are, are definitely aware of you know, climate change to, to really affect life here. It's very low-lying islands, which are even now prone to flooding. Do you think that art installations like this one might change a person's mind or make them think about it more? Do I think art can save the planet? I do, actually. That's what art does, I think. It, it can create debate around lots of issues and make us ask questions. What is this about? What are we doing? Loch Matty is small, but it's home to a vibrant arts community, which includes the museum and a cohort of students taking university art classes. Initially, nobody really knew what it was. We thought maybe it was a marker for the ships. So I think we started handing out like little leaflets and things like that to people going, it's actually art. It's kind of highlighted the issue a wee bit more. Like, it's a visually drastic, quite a striking mm -hmm. image. You're walking around the building and you're realizing the lights at your neck height, and you're like, oh, be very wet. Lines is rooted in science, but it showcases the most extreme predictions for the not-so-distant future, where the highest storm surge projections combine with the high tide. Now, whether or not the Lines installation is good art is for someone else to decide, but it does seem to be effective. What did you think once you realized what it symbolized? Quite shocked because that would mean for that part of Loch Madi would be lost to Kershba, the field, the whole lot. We're facing the effects on the planet and really nothing you hear is being done to combat it. If that scenario of climate change actually occurs, this entire area is going to be unlivable. Yeah. Has anybody reacted negatively to this? I haven't heard any uh, any kind of negative reactions. There is a possibility that it would uh, frighten people. That yeah. I think we need to be frightened. I think it is about facing reality. This is what's going to happen if we don't change. We all know that we don't go around expressing affection and support by smelling hair, talk, like touching softly and intimately. Like, that's not, you only do that with close friends. That might be normal in his world, but not in our world, America. The women who have voiced their concerns about Joe Biden, they've stated they were uncomfortable by his actions, but thought what he was doing was not sexual assault. I think it's disappointing that everything I keep reading on, you know, online compares it to the Me Too movement. That cheapens the Me Too movement. It's not ideal, but he does it because he's a, a caring, compassionate man, and he comes from a different time. Joe Biden is a big old fucking cunt. I hope y'all have a nice day. <laughs>